dueling languages. <laughs> Um, I don't want to create the impression that that it is dueling languages because I think uh, Python and um, Julia exist in uh, their own niches um, and and I think they can coexist in, in interesting ways. Um, and so I want to give a, uh, a an overview of um, our support at NERSC um, uh, for the Julia language and and. Um, this is a little open-ended in the sense that I have some examples and um, demos prepared. Um, so please ask questions during my talk, and I don't, I can't see the uh, the, the the chat. So if someone sees questions in the chat, please just yell at me uh, uh, so that I I get that I actually answer them. Um, so basically, don't wait until the end for asking questions. Um, all right, so so. The reason why I find Julia um, tempting and, and very compelling at, a, at, at centers like NERSC is that uh, uh, especially complex workflows really require um, something like uh, a high productivity, high performance language. And so it's, it's really, it comes down to high performance glue code. Uh, and so uh, if we... Uh, if we look at, at, at workflows um, that require high productivity languages um, like Python, um, you usually see sort of this pattern where you have a uh, Python or like a high productivity glue code that tends to be low performance, gluing together uh, multiple uh, kernels that are written in a high productivity language, uh, so high performance language, low productivity language, like, like C or Fortran. Uh, and so um, uh, the advantage of this approach is that um, in many cases, uh, the, the right algorithm, so the right language is used to address the right kind of algorithm. In that case, we really want to maintain uh, this idea of kernels. However, we start to introduce as we more, uh, introduce more languages, we start to introduce more complexity in our software stack. So it's more difficult to maintain and also we have to be careful that context switching between different uh, languages doesn't introduce uh, performance overhead. And so here's an example. I hope everyone can see my, my mouse. Maybe I can make it. Here we go. Uh, here's an example that, uh, um, uh, that, that sort of illustrates this. If you look at the following function calls uh, and then compare the pi bind 11 uh, time uh, the, the time just to make the function call. So I'm comparing basically functions do nothing. So it's um, one round trip. Um, then um, we can see that there's a, a almost, I mean, maybe a 50x uh, a slowdown. Uh, sorry, but there's a 50x speed up to using Julia. Um, actually, it's sort of a cheat because it's not actually Julia calling these functions. The way, and, um, the way that Julia actually works is, you know, your scripted language, your Julia program gets ingested by the Julia just-in-time compiler and it is, and the, the Julia JIT uh, compiler um, produces LLVM IR and, and then has LLVM uh, compile it to a native code. So when you do something like C call, you're actually just natively calling that function like within C is calling C. So, um, so it's really just uh, pointer resolution and, and that sort of thing that that's causing, that's the overhead here. Um, all right, so I'm using, I'm, I'm using this as sort of a motivation. I think uh, when you're uh, representing an up and coming language, you also have to motivate uh, in other ways. Uh, so one way is to uh, point out that NERSC has been interested in supporting Julia uh, well before I started at NERSC. And um, when you conduct surveys of uh, the uh, Julia user community, um, you find that even though, um, for example, this survey here conducted in 2020, uh, about three quarters of uh, users said they're not using Julia. Uh, when you ask them, do they plan, to, how, uh, how many users plan to use Julia in the future? It's about 50%. So basically half of the folks that are currently not using Julia, if this is a representative survey, uh, half of the folks currently not using Julia, excuse me, um, a third of the folks roughly not using Julia um, plan to use Julia in the future if, they, if they're given uh, the, the right support. And so um, the objective at NERSC has been to make um, uh, using Julia easy 
Um, and so the, the model that um, we are using is that we need to enable users to roll their own uh, uh, Julia install. So the idea is we have um, multiple levels of Julia support. Um, the, the most uh, low, the, the, the most easy way uh, for users to use Julia is just to use our module. And um, that introduces a whole bunch of pre-compiled packages that have been pre-configured using nurse systems. So that would be, you know, D tier, oops, excuse me, D tier here. And then um, uh, you might want to start to mess with your own version of MPI. So, so we, what we do is we provide both um, compatibility interfaces like MPI trampoline, and also we're using the preferences.jl mechanism to make sure that um, uh, the correct settings are picked up when a package is installed. So um, maybe a little dig at, at Python. If I went, uh, you know, pip install MPI for Py without any additional uh, settings, it will do the wrong thing. So uh, the nice thing about Julia is you can create what are called global preferences. Um, and for example, uh, you would tell the MPI preferences to use the Cray compiler wrappers. And then all that a user has to do is go, you know, package add MPI. And it will and say, aha, I'm, I can't just use a, 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 GC, a MPI CC uh, or something like that. I have to use the compiler uh, wrappers. Of course, you can still disable this, but they have to actively disable this. They can't just accidentally stumble into the wrong uh, build. Also, um, we monitor Julia users uh, at NERSC. Um, uh, so here is an example of um, uh, module load statistics. So this was assembled by Annette Greiner just two days ago. So um, thank you very much. And what you can see is that the monthly Julia users has been steadily growing um, until roughly here, which somewhat coincides with Perlmutter coming online. And so um, this, um, I hope the slowdown is because people are going over to Perlmutter and we're currently not monitoring uh, uh, module log statistics on Perlmutter. So I'm kind of curious to see what happens when I- uh, What's when the top line on that, that circle? This one? Yeah, what's the top line? Uh, this one here. Yeah. So uh, users of nurse, yeah, users of nurse uh, oh, data. The first, the first block. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're coming for you. Okay. No, it's not adversarial. I mean, come on. No, I uh, guess what I want to say is that uh, it's not an insignificant number of people who are already using uh, Julia at NERSC. Um, so please let me keep my job. Um, and another very quick aside is that uh, Julia users tend to like new versions. So when you look at the um, uh, different module loads for the different package versions, you can see in green, that is 1.42. So there's still some legacy users uh, at the moment. Um, and then um, uh, blue is 1.6. And basically the moment that I got around to actually enabling some newer versions, they all ticked up immediately. And there's a a very uh, strong tendency to use the latest stable version, but then in this per, uh, in this this brown here, you have beta users as well. So so Julia like uh, Julia uses like really new versions, which is kind of uh, important to know. Um, and then uh, in the future, um, you know, I, I'm I'm basically looking at the uh, work that is was done around Python in terms of monitoring package usage. Um, and I have, I have some prototypes um, that um, aren't quite production ready, but that pretty much use the same mechanism where you can place at exit hooks in the startup.jl uh, and then use that to monitor what packages you, Julia users had actually used during their um, uh, work, like in their workflows. Um, all right. So uh, before I jump into some. Uh, um, example code, I kind of also want to give a, a brief overview of the package ecosystem. And unlike Python, I can't show lots of pretty pictures. The reason is that we don't have huge uh, companies behind us that have graphics designers that make wonderful logos. Um, and instead, it's, it's just people with Inkscape. Uh, 
So, so I, unfortunately, these, these slides will look a little bit drab compared to Daniel's slides, but um, I, I'm actually going to transfer some of this to our documentation so that uh, folks have, um, have like a nice list of references available uh, in case they want to look at them later. But essentially, the organizations to follow, um, by the way, all Julia packages are managed by GitHub. So um, you can pretty much just look for package name .jl, GitHub, and you'll almost always find uh, the, the correct repo. Um, and, and on GitHub, they're organized in the following um, uh, uh, organizations. Um, so Julia IO and Julia data is really helpful in case you're looking for things to access data and manipulate data. Um, uh, Julia parent is sort of traditional HPC kind of workflows plus multiprocessing, fun stuff like that. And of course, Julia GPU, which is currently where a lot of activity is happening is obviously for GPU uh, programming. Um, now, uh, so let's look at some interesting IO packages. I wanna point out that pitfile.jl isn't really an IO package, but it's really interesting um, when you start to do a lot of parallelism um, and, and Julia lends itself to doing a lot of uh, parallelism out of the box without having to do any changes to the code. Uh, sorry. Anyway, um, you'll find that you might have multiple ranks that want to read the same file or manipulate the same file. And uh, it becomes, uh, you, you can start to get race conditions really quickly. And so pit file is a standard lib uh, package. It provides the Linux Unix uh, pit file mechanism to just hold mutexes that, that belong to files. Um, then, uh, oh, and it, it, it's held in the file system, so, so you don't, um, it's not like a threading mutex, it, it's uh, shared by the file system. Anyway, um, HDF5 and ZAR are uh, pretty common uh, packages uh, for high performance um, array like or table like data uh, in, in binary format. Uh, JLD and JLD2 are uh, serialization. Uh, formats, they're a bit like pickle, basically, only they don't break all the time. Uh, and and actually, actually, you want to use JLD2 if you don't want stuff to break. Um, so, so that's why JLD2 was invented. I think it was someone who was annoyed that pickle and JLD kept breaking. Um, and tables, uh, data frames, and csv.jl are your common uh, tabular data format. And here's an interesting thing that um, uh, is, is uh, kind of helpful. If you want to embed a lightweight uh, database in your application that is uh, multi uh, process, like that's either distributed via multiple processes or multi threaded, uh, take a look at JuliaDB. Um, if you are building uh, web applications, um, you don't always have to use Python. Uh, for example, I built all my web applications on Spin using Julia. Um, so the, the um, packages here um, really fall into two categories. Um, you can use http.jl uh, together with MUX or Oxygen uh, to build your uh, like a lightweight middleware um, for HTTP routing. So, for example, Oxygen uh, is is the Julia version of Fast API. Um, and if you want to build a fully fledged uh, web application, uh, I recommend Genie. Um, Genie is a bit massive, so it does have a big learning curve. But once you you've got Genie. Um, you can build uh, pretty sophisticated websites. <clears throat> All right. So traditional HPC support uh, is provided uh, via MPI.jl. And if you kind of want to go a little bit beyond the, the normal MPI application uh, um, uh, constraints, I recommend that you take a look at uh, cluster managers. So these allow you to... Um, schedule resources on the fly. So for example, the Slurm cluster manager allows you to, to, to submit more work into Slurm using Julia. Um, and the MPI cluster managers uh, create a, kind, a, a cluster manager kind of um, uh, environment uh, built on top of uh, MPI. Um, implicit global grid and uh, MPI race then lives on top of that and allows you to do the um, communication via array-like objects entirely. So they sort of emulate a, um, a global address space. Um, 
in case there are questions in the chat, just a reminder. Um, I think I see the chat pop up every now and then, but I can't see the messages. There's nothing urgent, I think. Sorry? Oh, nothing okay. urgent in the Zoom chat. All right, all right. Um, oh, all right. Um, now, Julia's native parallelism is, um, a, is a little bit like multiprocessing. Um, in that it, it um, natively spins up threads or uh, processes and then allows you to distribute work over them. But a, a rich ecosystem has been uh, built on top of that to um, perform task-based, like basically producer consumer style HPC, uh, sorry, um, um, uh, parallel processing. And so um, for that, I recommend that you take a look at distributed.jl um, and especially dagger.jl. And they are very similar to Dask and Ray, except that they're not as mature and therefore crash all the time. Um, but I have got them to work uh, on Perlmutter um, and actually um, uh, they, they're taking shape now. So if you start experimenting in your applications with them now, within a few months, I'm pretty sure that we can get something uh, stable um, on our systems. Um, and then on top of that, we have uh, D tables and distributed arrays that once again create like an array interface or table interface uh, across tasks. Um, slotted sort of uh, alongside this is flux.jl. And I just wanted to mention that that's basically our version of PyTorch. Um, and then finally, uh, GPU support is provided uh, via CUDA.jl at NERSC. And then of course, AMD GPU.jl. If you have AMD GPUs or one API.jl, if you've got Intel GPUs. Um, on top of those packages, I can recommend the um, uh, kernel abstractions. Uh, they're a bit like Cocos and they essentially allow you to just write your um, like write abstract algorithms and then that generates portable code. All right, demo time. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to basically show, um, good grief, I have to close this. Okay, I'm going to show, um, uh, some slides uh, from a larger set of, of examples and slides uh, give, uh, shown here, just so that folks get a, a basically a, a gentle introduction. Um, and then we're sort of going to work ourselves towards an example where we use flux.jl to analyze uh, some data, so to um, do some time series prediction. Um, all right, so um, I want to uh, really start by just giving a um, just a, a, an overview of the structure of a, a Julia program. Um, it's a little different to Python uh, in that your, um, your, your object orientation is handled via um, functions which have methods. I'll get to that in a second. And namespaces are isolated using modules. So uh, let's have a look at, um, at it from a top down. So modules are, um, uh, they're basically given by the module keyword. Uh, Julia uses bracketing by a uh, statement. And then if it's a multi-line statement, you use end to, to indicate the end of it. Um, so no indentation unless you want it um, and no curly braces. Um, and so a common uh, structure around uh, your source code is you define a module which includes some source files and the source file will define several functions and helper functions and so on. And then in the module, you'll expose only those functions that you want to be public. You can still get to the helper function by explicitly referencing it, but um, the export statement, um, when you use the using module keyword, um, uh, the, that's what, what export is used for. That's, uh, those functions then enter the global namespace. So here's an example. It has a, a, a my helper and a my func, and the my func calls my helper. And my, my help is exposed publicly. Oops. Uh, all right. So um, here's an example of, of how that works. Um, if you have uh, module A and module B, and both of those modules uh, provide a function called hello then um, I can call e each individual function using the module name dot function name syntax. So for example, I can call module a dot hello or module b dot hello. 
All right, so that's really all you need to know about modules, right? It's they're used to encapsulate namespaces. Um, next, we need to um, just have a brief foray into flow control. Um, so uh, flow control, um, once again, is used, um, you know, using if while for um, so if while for um, a try and so on, and they always ended with uh, end. The do uh, statement is not a loop. It's something slightly different, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so first, let's start with compound expressions. They are expressions that um, use begin and end. And um, the idea is the last, the result from the last expression is returned. So uh, for example, z here is equal to x plus y. It doesn't uh, cause a namespace isolation. So x and y are still available. So if I, if I just tried to show y, then I'd get that. Uh, if else if else and end, oops, it's pretty obvious here <laughs> what 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 they do. I'm going to skip across that. But of course, we also have the ternary operator. So this uh, operator um, returns the b if if a is true, otherwise c. Um, and of course, we have short circuit evaluation, and that's controlled using the and 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 um, pipe pipe operators for and and or. Uh, so, for example, um, x was less than y in this example, so you evaluate the second expression. Uh, so this is the, um, a very common design pattern in Julia to create one line conditional execution. Um, all right. Uh, loops are pretty standard as well. You've got four, uh, and while do is not a loop. Uh, and loops are different, though, from Python and from um, C style syntax in that they are inclusive. So for example, uh, here you've, you've got a range expression that goes from one to 10, including one and including 10. And so if I then printed that, I would get you know, the sequence of numbers. Um, while uh, you, know, you could emulate a, a, a C style while loop this way, um, you never really do it. Uh, Try catch is also really common um, uh, pattern. Um, it is pretty much the same uh, as you would expect in Python, um, in that you catch every error, then you can use isa to check what kind of error it is. Uh, so it's not like um, uh, C++ style uh, catch statements that only catch specific errors. If you want to then uh, continue the error, escalation if, if it's not an is a then you use the rethrow command which i've forgotten on this here um, and finally you can use finally and finally always executes uh, regardless of the uh, state of the catch okay i've said that asynchronous programming is um, uh, will basically come later um, <clears throat> but that's part of the flow control uh, of julia as well all right functions functions are using the function keyword um, the only thing that's maybe slightly different is that you can use return, but you can also just return the last line of the function. Um, yeah, so uh, you can do uh, single line functions. I, I really like those for, for brief functions. And in, in expressions like these, where the multiplication is implicit, it uses multiplication. So this is two times x, right? And so if I ran that, I get six. All right. Um, and um, functions can also be uh, treated like function pointers. So I can just uh, pass a function to another function and execute that within the uh, function body. Um, so for example, um, if I have a function that's x plus one, then this other function, uh, we'll just call it, it's a, it's a little example, but I think you get the point. Um, you can use anonymous functions. Um, using the arrow notation. So uh, this is like a Lambda expression in C++ or in Python. Um, and the nice thing is this is where do comes in. Do and is a multi-line Lambda. So for example, um, this here, this do block really creates the same Lambda as we saw before. But uh, the, the way that this syntax works is Whatever you put in the in the beginning of the do statement has to have the first variable accept a function because that variable gets the anonymous function. So here, my apply function uh, 
function, which remember, takes another function, just executes it. <laughs> um, that takes, that now ingests this do statement. All right. So now you had the uh, three minute introduction to, um, uh, um, to the, the uh, Julia language uh, syntax, uh, the, the program structure, sorry. <clears throat> now let's have a look at something that is uh, particularly relevant to Julia itself. Um, and that these are uh, data types, methods, and introspection. So you probably um, have like five minutes, Johannes, if that's okay. I realize. Uh, <laughs> so may, maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, take a look at uh, this later. Um, I do want to point out one thing, and that is um, a method is an implementation of a function. So you can use a data type annotations to give a function multiple methods. That's how we get um, multiple dispatch, aka function overloading. Um, so for example, uh, I want to build a function that takes double, uh, uh, that this doubles the int part of a, of a number. So if I give it, if, if I give double int uh, a integer, it just returns two times. If I give it a float, it will only double the integer part. Um, the way we would uh, implement that in Julia is we would write a function for integer inputs, right? So here you say, you've got the function double int, and if X is an integer, then return two times X. If double int is, uh, get, receives an abstract float, so anything that derives from the float data type, then we find the, the remainder and we double the integer part and add the remainder. Uh, and you can see it in action. Um, and you can also use the methods command um, to list the methods that any given function has. So um, I, there's way more to this, including maybe one, one thing I do want to say is um, you can ask Julia to return the uh, LLVM uh, code and the native code using code load. Code lower just shows the resolved um, uh, Julia code. So here it, 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 it tells you, okay, it, this is an int. So I'm going to return the code that corresponds to two times X. Um, and if I put in 2.1, then you see it's, it, it picks up the code for finding the remainder and then it uh, doubles the uh, integer part and adds the remainder. Now, if you say, well, how does LLVM treat this? Then you can just go code LLVM. And then finally, uh, this is the double part, which sort of goes down the screen. Um, <clears throat> all right, I, I, want to, I wanted to point that out because it means that you don't need third-party tools to figure out what your um, uh, code is doing. Um, uh, I am skipping all of that. As you can see, there's lots more uh, things to explore in this uh, uh, presentation that's available on GitHub. Um, I do want to uh, point out um, that, um, and we're gonna switch to the example now. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of right. So, so we're, not, we're not going to uh, go into depth with this example, um, but, May, uh, it's, it's helpful to look at it anyway so that you see all of these action, uh, things in action. Um, so anyway, what we want to do is we've got Apple stock prices and we want to uh, do a time series prediction on that. Uh, the way we would do that in Julia is first, for example, I have some data in a CSV file. So I'm gonna use CSV to read that data as a data frame. So that's what that line does. Then, I am going to, and, and there are several things happening at once here. I'm going to take the closing price out of my data set and I'm gonna cast that to float 32, but I want to do an element wise operation. So that's why I do this. Um, and then I construct views into my data set um, uh, that correspond to the training uh, data, right? So uh, my today's price is my input, tomorrow's price is going to be my target for the neural network to learn. 
Right, so we're gonna use Flux. And Flux, uh, just very quickly, it requires the inputs to have a slightly different shape for neural networks. So we use an expression like this to create a vector of uh, vectors, right? So these are little, think of it this way. Uh, the, uh, the recurrent neural network expects a fragment of a time series, in this case, a fragment of size one. Later in this uh, spreadsheet, in, in this, not spreadsheet, in this slides, you can actually see what happens if I take a window of maybe four or five elements. Times uh, I take a snapshot of one uh, and uh, I want to pass that into my recurrent neural network as a vector, and that's why I do this. By the way, there's no penalty doing this in Julia because it gets compiled into native code anyway. Um, so um, you don't have to worry about things not being always just vectors. Um, and so then I'm gonna construct a model. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm skipping a little fast here, but the point is I'm gonna uh, import flux and I'm going to create a model that just chains together recurrent neural network and then a dense layer. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, then I'm almost ready to start training. I'm going to define a loss function. Um, this, uh, uh, um, this is me being just a bit crazy, um, but you, you can take a look at this. This is basically having a loss function that reacts differently to getting a single time, a single snapshot in time compared to a time series. And I'm basically using the data type annotations to pick up which kind of loss function uh, based on what, what the inputs are. All is explained uh, offline, basically. And then I'm going to use flux.train. And that really good takes us to the uh, end, basically, um, where we um, all we in flux, the train function, all it does is it creates a gradient uh, and then takes the gradient of that um, of the loss function and updates uh, the model. That's what train does. If I ran that, you know, I would get you know, this kind of loss function, which is, which is sort of very common, basically, the, we get some diminishing returns at some point from training. And then if we looked at our, um, we looked at our trained model, it, you can see um, the red line is a trained model. It does terribly at the beginning, and then it, it really picks up on the Apple stock price. And the, with this, um, I'm basically uh, ending the presentation. I want to leave you with one thought, though, and that's kind of neat. If I want to use GPUs, all I need to do uh, is I just need to uh, take my model, send it to uh, using CUDA.jl, send that to the GPU, then send my data to the GPU and run exactly the same code because the data type is now different. So CUDA will realize, aha, different data type, I have to compile new code. So it looks up, what do I do if it's a CUDA array? And CUDA.jl is basically telling uh, Julia how to generate LLVM code to drive a GPU rather than a CPU. And so if I ran this, eh, you can see my GPU um, activity is picks up and it starts to run. This is on Cori GPU. Um, and so um, I can't plot, <laughs> like I had to fail over to Cori GPU. So things are configured badly here, but uh, so now it's training on uh, a GPU. Um, all right, and with that, uh, I, I'll, I also point out that we have a paper coming out, so keep an eye out for, for this paper, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.